uh, in-store pharmacies for them. Uh, every little helps, um, which was the case when I handed in my invoice. But uh, around about 1998, I became a NHS prescribing advisor, in, in particular in the Lincolnshire area, uh, part of um, Brave New Labour's NHS. Um, I was working in with GPs, etc., um, looking at their prescribing, and then one day I was opened up a pharmaceutical journal. I saw an advert um, for a company called Walida, uh, which are a natural medicines company, and they're based down in Derbyshire, and they were looking to um, train pharmacists um, in natural medicine. Now, I've always had an interest in plants, and uh, um, so I thought I'd go for the interview, and um, I uh, got the post. Um, a mate of mine <laughs> was actually on the panel, so, uh, but uh, no, I did express an interest in plants and um, a potential natural medicine, and I really enjoyed my time there, and I stayed with the company um, on a part-time basis. Um, I was so enthused, I um, got really interested in herbs, and um, I then did a degree in herbal medicine at uh, Lincoln University, uh, which I did part-time over five years, um, which I, um, yes again, found absolutely fascinating. And um, as a result of that, I then joined Lincoln University School of Pharmacy as a senior lecturer. And um, yes, it was, uh, that's my kind of like career path. So I've got an interest in conventional and, and also natural medicines as well. I'm an area I do lecturing is mainly evidence-based medicine, uh, which is very much um, de detailing um, conventional medicines as well. One thing when I first started my herbal medicine degree, um, the uh, a tutor of it um, gave me a really useful piece of advice. It says, if you break your leg in three places, a, her a comfrey compress ain't gonna do you any good. The best place you can go is Lincoln County A&E. And I think that's a quite useful advice. There are many areas where conventional medicine is, you know, almost certainly um, the first port of call. And uh, I would um, always um, go down that route. Now I need to be able to do the slides. I don't know if that's... Uh, uh, no, this should be, there it is. Is that working? Oh, yes. Um, some people are highly critical of natural medicines. Um, I think I've heard the word scam used, which is uh, supplementary, complementary and alternative medicine. Um, and that's, there's obviously quite a lot of critics of that. And uh, is an example of a person being critical. And uh, seeing it's uh, St. Patrick's Day, I thought I'd introduce Dara for you. Uh, I've got my Guinness, um, so cheers. I'll have a quick swig. And here's a kind of comment, um, I'm a lance in the boil. Remember when Frankie Boyle was funny? Anyway, I'm sorry, herbal medicine. Oh, herbal medicine has been around for thousands of years. Indeed it has. And then we tested it all. And the stuff that worked became medicine. And the rest of it is just a nice bowl of soup and some potpourri. So knock yourselves out. Um, so yeah, there is a cohort of people in this country. Um, I call them the usual suspects who are, are very critical of natural medicine, um, sense about science, as those of people like that who, uh, who, uh, who over the years have been very keen to knock it and criticise um, natural medicine. Um, been a bit quiet at the moment. Um, I think they spend most of the time on Twitter, which is somewhere I don't reside. So, uh, um, but the criticism I would have of them is: have they taken the time or trouble to actually study something like herbal medicine? Yeah, uh, and that would be my critique of what they're saying. You know, they're looking at it from a very narrow point of view. Now, I'm going to quote this guy. Um, I think um, came up with a far more erudite quote. Um, this is T.S. Eliot. Um, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. That's is going to be the theme of my um, uh, talk is that yes, we, we, we use science and I'm a huge fan of science and the, the amazing things that, that, that it does. But sometimes we sometimes need to take a step back and look at how we've done things in the past and look at some of the common themes, a the common philosophy. All the talks we talked about a perennial philosophy. And I think that's something we need to consider doing, especially as at a time when our environment is you know, at, um, at risk. Now, the first thing people say to me, well, there can't be any evidence for herbal medicine um, or herbs in general. Um, yes and no. Um, we're certainly not going to get any decent studies done in the UK. Um, there's a huge negativity towards these kind of topics, this kind of area. 
but in other countries we do see um, her, um, clinical studies being done um, and one country that uses herbal medicine quite significantly is Germany. Um, there's a picture of Hildegard of Bingen, who was one of the original herbalists around the 12th century, who wrote many books on uh, use of herbs and um, natural medicines. Um, and this is kind of like in inculcated within their society. Um, like all German doctors, for instance, um, have training in herbal medicine um, as part of their, their course. Um, as you probably notice, other countries, herbal medicine is huge significantly. Um, the big one, of course, being China, um, which is, you know, we all know that um, Chinese herbal medicine is, is huge. And who's ever been there, we'll see um, every street seems to be um, areas where you can obtain um, herbal medicines. A couple of years ago, I went to Iran and um, they um, use herbal medicine significantly. Matter of fact, one of the wings of one of their medical schools, for instance, in Tehran has um, got an entire section given over to herbal medicine. Um, India, we see quite a lot. Um, Russia um, as well. Um, so some of the F what I call the Shanghai cooperation countries um, do have a, 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 a bent towards herbal medicine. And some of them are actually encouraging its use, which is slightly different to probably what the attitudes you get in this country. So... Uh, uh, and some of these countries aren't backward, are they? Let's face it. Um, I'm just reading that China's just overtaken America in quantum computing and has overlapped them in that respect, So, which is the next big thing. Um, so evidence, my lord, or should, should I say my lady? Um, um, what about evidence? So where do we go for evidence? And this applies not just to herbs, but it applies to medicine in general. Uh, we can go to various sources for robust evidence. Um, unfortunately, these aren't robust sources. Um, don't give up your statins. That's uh, what the Daily Mail are telling us there. Um, death rate at all time low, the Daily Express. Statins can be a risk to your health, according to the Daily Express. And uh, statin is a new wonder drug. Um, as you can see, this is probably not the, the, the area to go to for robust evidence. Um, and partly due to the fact um, I've dealt with journalists, um, their understanding of evidence and medicine in general is, is pretty weak. Um, so where would we go? Well, the big it is obviously um, what I call high impact journals. If you want to get a decent study done, then the areas we go into are um, the two main British ones, the BMJ, um, British Medical Journal, um, The Lancet, um, um, edited by the excellent Richard Horton. Um, um, these are high impact journals. So if you get a paper published in any of these um, journals, you know, you know, it's been properly reviewed. It's been peer reviewed independently by independent reviewers. So an example of that, the Lancet has published the Russian uh, study on Sputnik V, the COVID vaccine, and Richard Horton published that, and that was peer reviewed. So the, they, they take an attitude, since it's high quality science, they will publish it if it's been peer reviewed, high impact. Now, the three main um, um, American ones are Annals of Internal Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA, and also the New England Journal of Medicine. So really, if you want to get anything read or, 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 or known, you really need to be looking at these particular journals. Now, what kind of studies will they publish? Or what are they interested in? Well, they're interested, um, this is where a little bit of science goes in, in there, they're interested in double blind, randomized placebo controlled studies. Okay, that's what they're interested in. Now, what's one of those? Well, for instance, we, for instance, um, let's take a, a, a landmark study I would call, which is a high quality study that was um, done in the UK. That's a heart protection study. And we take 30,000 patients, 30,000 people, and half will get the active uh, drug or therapy. So in this case, it was in for statin 40 milligram of statin. Other half will get placebo. OK, now the person getting the medicine and the person giving the medicine have no idea whether they're getting the placebo or the active. They are blind. They are double blind. OK, so that's where we have the randomized. So they're randomized. They don't know they're getting the active or not. Ideally, what we do is we let the patients take those medicines for up to five years. In this particular case, it was a five year study, but it has been ongoing as well. And then at the end of the day, we count the number of people who are alive 
in the active group and we count the number of people alive in the placebo group. Now, we're looking at death because that is what we call a primary endpoint. In a good study, I'm looking for primary endpoints, okay? So ideally, what you want is more people alive in the active than in the placebo. Now, to get a rough idea, Zinvastatin 40 milligram um, was used in people at high risk, such as type 2 diabetics, um, et cetera, um, people who've got ischemic heart disease. Um, and for every 23 patients who took Zinvastatin over the five years, you prevented one death or you prevented one stroke or heart attack. So that's significant because some of these people are going to be taking these drugs for, how shall we say, 20, if you're a 40 year old type 2 diabetic, you may be taking these drugs for 30 or 40 years. You think of the risk reduction you're making. We call it an absolute risk reduction. And for instance, yeah, you may, for every six or seven people taking that for over 30 years, you may prevent one death. So you can see from these double blind randomized placebo controlled studies, we can tell whether something's actually going to work or not. Okay. And that's what I look for um, strong evidence that we, we, we know that the therapy works because it removes all bias, okay, yeah. So take, for instance, the AstraZeneca AZ COVID vaccine, for instance, 12,000 people got the active, 12,000 the control, and therefore you would measure the number of people who are admitted into hospital because that is an end point, yeah, that's hard end points, okay? So we weren't looking at antibodies or anything like that, we're looking at the deaths or number of people admitted into hospital. And obviously that's published in The Lancet uh, by Richard Hall. So we need to be double blind because there are numerous influences. So in, historically we've made painkillers red, for instance, uh, because we know red helps people with their pain more. <laughs> those kind of things can have some influence. So you need to remove all those biases. So the top studies we have are randomized, double blind controlled studies. So that's what we were looking for in something like COVID vaccines, for instance, is a double blind study. Now, what the press sometimes quotes um, are cohort studies. For instance, you may get somebody saying, oh, um, it might be published in the Daily Mail or whatever, or other good uh, newspapers are available. Yeah, red wine um, makes you live longer. That might be one of the articles they may have. Well, that is based from a cohort study. Now, there's numerous biases there. We call these confounders. So people who drink red wine, for instance, um, maybe more middle class. Yep, okay. And we know that deprivation from the Townsend scores, which is a measure of deprivation, plays a huge impact on people's life expectancy. So it may not necessarily be the red wine that's having the benefit. It might be other factors such as lifestyle. So we call those confounders, which is the reason why we need the double blind randomized controlled studies before we know any, whether any medicine or therapy works. That's why they're so important that we fund those. Now, the big problem we have, and this is where the problem is with herbal medicine, is that these studies are hellishly expensive. We're talking tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds, for instance. So you can imagine to do a really large, large scale study, only really the pharmaceutical industry can really have that kind of financial clout to do it. And this is where I think we need to take a look at herbal medicine and where funding needs to come elsewhere so that we can do robust RCTs increasingly on herbal medicines. Now, the usual suspects, as I call them, were complaining about um, um, one of the hospitals in London, which um, used to be called the Royal London Homeopathic Hospital, um, uh, which was also supplying herbal medicine therapy to patients. And, and they were looking at some of their literature, some of the advertising, and the usual suspects made a complaint um, to the Advertising Standards Agency. So the Advertising Standards Agency um, paid and had an independent review looking at some of the evidence from studies on certain types of herbal medicine. And they upheld many of the complaints that, um, I think it was the Nightingale collaboration, some group uh, who'd made the original complaint. But the um, Advertising Standards Agency said this, uh, conditions from which some herbal medicines were found to have some effects include functional dyspepsia, irritable bowel syndrome, premenstrual syndrome, back pain, osteoarthritis, depression, some forms of acute infections, including acute rhinosinusitis, the common cold, uncomplicated, i.e. mainly virus-related upper respiratory tract infections, 
rather appropriate at the moment, influenza type A and B and migraine. Now, what we had in these particular areas are some of them have got RCTs to back them up. Example would be that um, Vitus agnus castus, which is a herd we use in premenstrual syndrome, has had an RCT published in the BMJ. So we know we've got good evidence there. But surely it would be a good idea to look at some of the herbs that do have underlying evidence to do bigger studies, to do fund larger RCTs, to get the real robust evidence that we need before we can go about wholesale um, use of these. Now, if you look at some of those conditions, um, if you ask the average GP how many of people are sat in their waiting room in the morning um, uh, suffer from those conditions, it's quite a significant proportion of their workload. Um, <laughs> um, having worked in GP land for many years as a practice pharmacist, I know that is a huge um, part of their workload. Now, those are areas where I think herbal medicine, where we could do a lot more additional work and studies to see where it could potentially have significant benefits. Now, don't get me wrong, there are many conditions, in particular with conventional medicine, where herbal medicine can't go anywhere near it. It's not going to do any benefits at all. Um, um, if you think about so certain conditions like serious conditions like epilepsy, for instance, the, the drugs have massively improved over the past 30 years. Parkinson's, we've seen huge improvements in the therapies that conventional medicine operates. Rheumatoid arthritis, I certainly saw people with wizened hands, et cetera, 30 years ago. You don't see that now. The newer drugs that have come out, the monoclonal antibodies, for instance, have been a massive improvement. 10 grand a year worth every penny, as it were. So, so those are conditions where I wouldn't even think about herbal medicine. But there are these kind of conditions where I think research needs to be done and funding for these randomized placebo controlled studies. Some of these studies, I've got 100, 200 patients in. We need to do bigger studies. OK. So that's an example of areas where I think herbal medicine could be used. This is, as T.S. Eliot would say, let's go back to where we started and know it for the very first time. That's what we need to, to do in some of these areas. But this requires finance, uh, significant finance. We also need a change in attitude. Some countries are showing a change in attitude, in particular China and countries like that. Chances of running a decent RCT uh, on herbal medicine in this country um, about as high as Mansfield Town, my team winning the Champions League. Um, let's be pretty brutal about it. Um, so herbal concepts. Um, I'm going to talk about, about some of the concepts of herbalism. Um, is it sensible science? Um, so let's take a, a, a butcher's. Um, so me and computers don't work because when I'm retired, I have to use them then. Uh, but anyway, um, anything for a jar in pain. And this is how we see Chinese medicine, for instance, um, um, and that's, you know, if you go to China, many times I've seen, yeah, this is how they um, operate. So uh, if we see how um, you go and see the doctor in China and you may get a prescription, um, individualized prescription, you've got a selection of herbs there, maybe some naughty animal bits in there, unfortunately. Um, but in general with the herbs, they are boiled in water, hot water, and the person is then given yeah, a liquor to drink. Now, what we need to do is look at these traditional patterns that we, we see in these medicines, but kind of like add in a scientific basis to them. And increasingly in China and other countries, we're seeing high tech methods of extracting herbs being used. I'll give you an example of some of those is um, supercritical CO2. You may wonder what we're gonna do with all that CO2 in the upper atmosphere. We could actually use it to extract herbal medicines um, and at certain uh, critical um, temperatures and pressures um, carbon dioxide acts as a liquid stroke gas and that is very useful for extracting the active ingredients from herbal medicines from herbs and we can measure the amount of active ingredients using some very high tech kit this is high pressure liquid chromatography so we're applying the science um, very high tech science to herbal extraction and once we've got know the actual active ingredients for instance we can then give the herb we give the whole herb we don't just pluck out the active ingredient give the whole herb because something like agnes castus for instance um, works when you give the whole herb not when you just give separate ingredients and we could do that and then once you've got you know the active ingredients standardized extracts we can then obviously do the double blind randomized control studies 
So my attitude to herbal medicine is potentially using it as what we call phytotherapy. Um, yeah, borderline soft pharmaceuticals, but we're giving the herbs um, in the whole in, in entirety. So I'll give an example of how, um, think going back to where we started from, uh, the T.S. Eliot quote is an example of, of how this happened. Um, this was a, a lady uh, called To Yo Yo, um, who was a, a Chinese scientist who the Chinese government were very interested in trying to find treatments for malaria. Um, and um, they were doing a lot of studies. They were looking at how traditional Chinese practitioners were, were treating fevers. And um, they found the herbs they were using. And when they did extracted, did the extractions um, um, and then gave them some malaria parasites in the labs, they didn't really get many good results. Now, To Yo Yo, she um, thought, well, I'll go back to the villagers. I'll talk to the practitioners and see what they're doing. And they were using a herb called um, Artemisia annua or Sweet Annie. Um, and they were giving that to treat fevers. But she noticed they weren't using hot water extraction, which is normally done in Chinese medicine. They were extracting the herb using cold water processes. She thought, oh, OK, then she went back to the labs and she decided to use cold extraction methods to try and get what the active ingredients were from the plant. And as a result of that, they discovered um, 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 some of the substance called artemisinin. And that is now the most effective treatment we've got for treating malaria. Um, probably one of the only real ones we've got for treating malaria. Um, it was so successful, she actually won the Nobel Prize for medicine, um, I think it was in 2015. So she went back to where she started from and knew the thing for the very first time. And that is what we need to do when it comes to using herbal medicines. So you can, there's a classic example that's probably saving um, tens of thousands of lives you know, all the time, um, because it, it's certainly in Africa, I've certainly seen artemisinin being used um, heavily to treat malaria, and it does work, um, certainly true. Now, obviously, um, the Chinese um, obviously use herbs quite a lot, and there's, there's an example of a controversial um, issue that we're coming across at the moment. Um, this is a, a herb called Andrographis paniculata. Um, I won't pronounce the Chinese because uh, I, in herbal medicine, we only use the Latin binomial nomenclature because you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's tractum aficionale. I, I don't know what a dandelion is, to be honest. Um, and that's because everyone in the world will use that nomenclature, whether you're Chinese, German, British, American, or whatever. That way we can identify the plants. And we only use plants um, that you'll see in nature. We don't use hybrids um, because that's what's historically been used in practice. And they're the ones that we know we've got an um, example and know may potentially work. So here we've got um, controversy over andrographis because the Chinese have obviously been using it in COVID um, uh, therapies um, over, over in China. Um, the Thai government, for instance, started doing the randomized controlled studies. Um, they got as far as phase two last time I looked. Um, this was just 60 patients, unfortunately. Um, the reason why they were interested in that is because historically, um, andrographis, um, um, this was a, a meta-analysis done by um, Southampton University, um, George Lewis down there. Um, and they looked at 37 randomized controlled studies. Um, appears beneficial um, and safe for relieving um, acute um, respiratory tract infections, which are invariably viral. Um, and short acting time of, um, they reduce um, short act time to symptom control. The problem they had from a lot of these studies was they tended to be of poor quality design. And they also tended to be done by many different little small herbal medicine companies. So they may have 50 or 60 patients in a study. They may have shown some benefit, even against placebo. But because you've got many different companies producing them, they may have different levels of active ingredients between the different types of um, products that have been um, assessed in their studies. Now, these herbal medicine companies, unfortunately, cannot afford to do the billion pound RCTs. But as you can see there, there is some indication that andrographis, for instance, has effect on viral upper respiratory tract infections. And it works by stimulating the immune system, which is how a lot of herbs actually work. They have a, a different approach to certain how we use that in the conventional approach. So there's been a lot of controversy about andrographis, obviously, over the past year with the problems that we've had with um, a virus that's going around. 
Now, this is an Indian form of medicine, uh, Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, we may have come across, you may have heard some of the terminology that's used, um, your chakras and your asianas and things like that. Don't get too uh, hung up about that because, as we shall see, there is a common theme through all of these types of medicine. Um, and in Western herbal medicine, uh, we use um, loads of different herbs. Now, we're, we're like magpies. Um, certainly when I train as a medical herbist, I don't practice anymore. Um, um, but yeah, we would use herbs from Chinese medicine. We'd use it from Ayurvedic medicine, India. We'd use Arabic herbs. We'd use Native American herbs, Echinacea being one. We'd use the entire lot. And why not? Why wouldn't you want to use herbs from all over the different cultures and, and all around the world? Just sort of ironic, as in countries like China, they tend not to use uh, Western herbs, for instance. And there's examples of Western herbs uh, frequently used in um, herbal medicine. Uh, we've got horse chestnut here, which um, uh, that conquers um, <laughs> some illnesses. Um, and the main use for that is in chronic venous insufficiency. Um, there's been several, which is poor circulation, veins, etc., within the legs. Uh, there's been a, a, some German RCTs, yet again, small numbers, 50, 60, 70 patients, did show some benefits, especially with another herb called butcher's broom. Um, yet again, it's a condition that's poorly treated by conventional medicine. So from my point of view, why don't we actually spend some money on decent RCTs, on standardized extracts that have been ex um, obtained using uh, supercritical CO2 to try and have a look at this condition um, with these herbs because the conventional therapies aren't that good. Even the evidence from the studies tells me that. So that's an example where I think herbal medicine could be implicated. And um, this is slightly unfortunate. Um, we did actually see a major RCT being done in Hawthorne. This is in heart failure, which is obviously a serious condition. But unfortunately, the study, it was in 2,680 patients. It's a fairly big study but it didn't show um, improvement in life expectancy. But unfortunately, the study was only 18 months, two years. It needed to be longer um, to get more robust data. But yet again, the, the big German herbal company that supported it, Schreb, um, yet again, it's a big cost for them as well. There's no patent on these products, as you can imagine. And we'll talk about a product I dealt with in the past, um, um, mistletoe. You know, we, we, we haven't got any, you know, sell an ampule for a pound. Well. Yeah, big pharma sells yeah, for thousands of pounds. So you can see where we haven't got the finances to, to, to run these bigger RCTs. And this is where organisations like Wellcome Trust, et cetera, should be helping to fund things like this. Even the National Lottery could do that too. So here's an interesting concept in herbal medicine. Um, and this is adaptogens. And this is used in all forms of herbal medicine. So we've had all these different systems that have developed from many different cultures and many different countries, all use the same processes. That's something that's interesting, isn't it? Um, they're using the same concepts. And adaptogens are herbs which help the body overcome stress. Um, we all have stress in our lives and we become depleted and deficient as a result of being drained by perpetual stress. And certainly has been the case over the past year. And we can use these herbs to support normal balance, bring rest restoration, shall we say, to the body's internal processes, internal systems. Um, so they increase the body's resistance um, to physiological and um, biological and emotional stress. So they can protect the liver, heart, etc., and, and certain other properties. Now in Western herbal medicine, um, certainly my uh, ex-tutor always talked about imbalances between two systems, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Um, this sounds very complex, there's a bit of pharmacology, but the parasympathetic is a rest and digest. You know, when you've had a big meal, etc. when I'm gonna have my chicken casserole uh, um, this evening, I'm gonna slow down, I'm gonna relax, um, rest and digest is happening there. Now we've got, this is balanced by our other part of our autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic system, which is the fight or flight which is governed by adrenaline and noradrenaline. Now, can imagine the lives we live today, the balance is tipped. So we get more serotonin, we get more cortisol being produced, the stress hormone from the adrenal glands, we get more adrenaline being produced. 
So we get an imbalance and that can lead to depletion and ultimately to illnesses. So in Western herbal medicine, we try and restore that balance so we can use herbs to try and restore that and adaptogens are uh, the herbs we would tend to use in that. Now, um, in the many different forms of herbal medicine, for instance, adaptogens are a mainstay of therapy. So astragalus, which is vetch, um, I'm going to show you a picture of that in a moment. Um, um, in Chinese medicine, it's very heavily used. So they use that. Um, Codonopsis is dangsheng, which is um, yet again heavily used in Chinese medicine. Glyceriza glabra um, is licorice, and we'd use that because um, the chemicals in um, um, licorice mimic the body's own natural steroids, uh, cortisol. They've got a very similar chemical structure. So you can see where um, that has its use. Um, Erythrococcus centicosus is Siberian ginseng, which is heavily used in Russia. As I said, Russia uses herbal medicine quite a lot. Withania is ashwagandha or win uh, winter cherry, and that's used in uh, Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, Panax ginseng was uh, from Korean medicine. Um, Herbally would use that in dementia, et cetera. Hydrocotyl is uh, gotacola, uh, gotacola, which is Ayurvedic. Um, also in Chinese, there's some overlap there as well. Polygonum, hishu wu, which is Chinese. Um, uh, Osium uh, sanctum is holy basil. Um, that's used in Ayurvedic medicine, uh, can control blood sugars, for instance. Um, rhodiola is an interesting herb. And that comes from Viking medicine. Um, it's Arctic rose. Um, I remember once going up to the very north tip of um, Norway. And um, even in August, uh, I got out of the car and it was absolutely hailing it down with hail and um, rain and wind and all sorts. I walked along the cliffs and they were full of Arctic rose growing there because it's a plant that loves stress. You see a bit of a relationship between how these plants live in the environments they live in and how they can potentially treat um, medical diseases. And Arctic Rose is what the Vikings used to take before they went into battle. Um, it used to send them berserk. Um, so, um, and there's obviously an interest in terms of um, using mental health, for instance. And Cordyceps is Chinese caterpillar fungus, which I'll uh, talk about, which is uh, from Tibetan medicine, but has now made its way to Chinese medicine um, for reasons I won't go into, uh, political reasons. What is interesting, though, is all these different types of herbal medicine from many different cultures over many centuries have the same conclusions. There's this perennial philosophy that Aldous Huxley talked about. This applies to religion, philosophy, but also to traditional forms of medicine. In Ayurvedic medicine, we'll talk about rasianas, for instance. Well, that's rejuvenation. Uh, well, isn't that they're similar to what we're doing with the herbs in Western medicine? We're rejuvenating the body. In Chinese medicine, where they'll use astragalus, for instance, that's a qi tonic or a superior herb. So it's the same thing. It's just they use a different terminology. And this is what takes people, unfortunately, the people who haven't studied this, struggle to understand this, this woo they talk about. Oh, this is all um, mumbo jumbo. No, once you peel back the onion and look closely, you have to think laterally, which sometimes um, a lot of people don't. They think logically. This requires lateral thinking, thinking sideways. Um, you can certainly see the overlap between all these different systems. And in Western herbal medicine, we're looking at drugs, uh, sorry, plants that work on um, this particular uh, systems, our hormonal and uh, um, sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. So that's a little bit of a talk about some of the principles that we'd use um, in terms of treating an individual. So from my personal point of view, I'm interested in the studies and using herbs potentially to treat certain conditions that I think where they'll be very useful. But if you're treating an individual, you'd almost certainly want to give something like adaptogenic herbs to help restore the imbalance. Think about conventional medicine. Can it really do that? Um, this is an area where I think you know, further research and, um, would be uh, particularly useful. Now, well, I do talk a lot, so my students say that, uh, Ian, do turn a record off. I want to introduce you to how I got into herbal medicine through um, a company called Walida. I'm not uh, got shares in the company, but it was working for them that kind of like drove my interest in natural medicine. And Walida was founded by a, a very interesting character um, in the 1920s called Rudolf Steiner, who um, 
Um, should we know anything about Rudolf Steiner? Um, well, um, yeah, one thing to be interested about him is because the usual suspects, which I've been talking about, absolutely can't stand him. Um, so it's a good reason for being interested in him. Um, but he was um, slightly interesting, off the wall character, shall we say. Uh, um, some of the thinkers um, harp. Um, he was a bit of a mystic and a clairvoyant. Um, so, um, so yeah, he was uh, had some very interesting ideas. But he also had some ideas which were quite interesting in terms of um, society and how we live. Um, I mean, you may have heard of the Steiner Wardour schools, for instance, um, which is uh, an interesting type of education. I don't think, I don't know a huge amount about it. I'm um, not something that flows my boat understanding that, but um, children don't start school till they're seven. Um, it's very child-centered education. It's very similar to the Finnish system, which uh, we all know is quite a, a good system. One thing they do in Steiner schools is they get children to grow their own food. Um, for instance, um, understanding how to make compost um, is very much on the curriculum and getting children to get their hands dirty and working with plants um, is very much part of their education. And uh, there was an interesting study um, um, published in the Lancet, lived on, um, Schwartz study, which was done in Sweden, which showed that Steiner children who had an anthroposophical lifestyle who followed this, who so went to these kind of schools, had much, much, much lower levels of asthma and atopy compared to the general population. And one thing we need to consider is that our gut um, system um, is full of chemicals, neurotransmitters, such as serotonin, which is present in our gut lining, for instance, and we require a, a healthy gut biome for health as well. And I think that's where we're going wrong. We're sanitizing everything at the moment. And so there's some superb research being done by Oxford University. Um, Ian Pavold, who's the head of respiratory medicine at Oxford University, he's, he's no, <laughs> um, is doing a lot of work looking at um, how biomes, for instance, within our gut um, can affect conditions like atopic conditions. And um, so that's a, a thing, thing we need to consider um, while we're busy sanitizing everything at the moment. Um, he also introduced the concept of architecture. He was very much in, in favor of traditional forms of architecture, going back where we started again. And this is an interesting point. Um, you look up Lincoln Hill, for instance, and you'll see a building there that's been there a thousand years. Um, hopefully it'll be there another thousand years. You look at modern forms of construction, how long do many of those last? Um, how often do we see, you know, shopping centers now being knocked down that have been there for 20 years? And what is interesting, um, late David Graeber, unfortunately, who, who passed away last year, um, coined the phrase um, bat um, s construction. And it's interesting that the construction industry, if every person in Britain, uh, every household recycled everything, um, all their plastic bags, all that kind of stuff, that would still be less than half of what the British construction industry sends to the landfill every year. Do you think we need to change the way we um, um, build? And this is part of what Steiner was trying to get across. Camp Hill communities, um, there's, a, there's a small communities. Um, notice the word community. I think we certainly need to be moving down that route. And these are small communities where people with learning difficulties um, um, live in small communities, where they're closely supervised by families, etc. And it's interesting, they're all given jobs, and one of their jobs is to make wooden toys for the Steiner schools, uh, because they're not our like plastic ones. Um, Introduced ethical banking. This is 1920. Uh, do you think we need any ethical banking? Um, uh, Triodos Bank um, is only invests in totally ethical um, um, adventures, um, environmentally sustainable. Um, um, this is, yeah, I think they're in the UK, obviously much bigger on the continent. And this is my main interest. This is what drove me into natural medicine was studying anthroposophical medicine. Um, one thing um, to be into anthroposophical medicine, I trained as an anthroposophical pharmacist, but um, to really practice, you'd obviously need to be a doctor. Um, and to do anthroposophical medicine, you have to do a standard medical training, um, you know, five years and then two years, F1, F2, and then be experienced and then do the additional training in natural medicine on top. And um, there's only, unfortunately, only two general practitioners um, GP clinics in the UK that practice this, obviously a huge number in Germany. 
and 80% of their prescribing is conventional, but 20% is natural. Now you may think, well, okay, well, what's that about? And that's because if you've got a gastric ulcer, for instance, you get a, a drug that treats it, yeah, a meprazole, but you may then give herbs alongside that. And this is a, a system that has, has developed where we're using the herbs to support the, the conventional system. As I've just said, in many areas, conventional medicine really does, you know, we can't really argue with that. And if you had to, if I had to name two um, inventions, um, greatest inventions that man has ever produced, I'd go antibiotics and vaccines. Yeah, we're not going to argue against that, I think. Um, but as I say, there are areas I've just tried to indicate where I think we need to introduce natural medicines as part of a holistic approach. Um, but don't try that in this country. Um, so he had some interesting thoughts with anthroposophical medicine. He talks about imbalancing forces, talks about astral forces, ego forces, all this kind of thing. But you notice the kind of philosophy that we've seen with other forms of natural medicine. It's exactly the same kind of approach, just is using terminology, which, you know, if you talk about ego forces, people are like, what the hell are you on about? You know, but if you pull back the uh, perennial philosophy, you know what, so, um, what's going on. And one thing he did introduce, um, if someone asked me to say, what's the first thing we need to change? And I don't know if you've heard of the organization called Regeneration, um, which has been run by Rory Spowers. Um, I've certainly joined myself. Um, they're talking about how we've got to change the way we operate significantly. I've just given you some indication of where we need to change in medicine. But the biggest area we need to change, first of all, is agriculture. And um, um, Rudolf Stein introduced something called biodynamics um, in the 1920s. It was being approached by farmers who were saying their crops were getting poorer, the soil was losing its fertility. Well, drive along um, any Lincolnshire field and you'll see that the soil is biologically dead in many areas. Um, and that's really um, a real big issue. I, I, I probably say that's our number one issue is restoring the vitality of our soil, for instance. And we can do that quite easily. Um, yeah, we don't need big geoengineering windmills and all this kind of stuff. We can make simple changes into the way that we produce food. Um, unfortunately, that's a, a, a big ask. And what does biodynamics do? Um, we treat, um, certainly at Walida, when we were growing the, the herbs, um, we had Shipley Park where we had acres of lands where we were growing the herbs. Sometimes I have open days, so that's where we're going when we're allowed to. Um, we'd grow the herbs biodynamically. And when it came to insuring the company, it wasn't the factory that was the first thing we insured, it was the compost heaps. And that is a vital role, that's a vital component of the business. And in nature, we have cyclical systems. For instance, we have cyclical, you know, there's no waste in nature. Only human beings produce waste, as we think linearly. Now, in a biodynamic system, we... Um, would maintain fertility within the system. Okay, so composting, adding to the soil growing plants, composting the plants, the waste, putting them in the compost heap, and then recycling. Now, this is where I'm going to be slightly controversial. Is any vegetarians in the, in the um, office or, or whatever, um, close your ears. Um, the cow, for instance, plays a vital role in a biodynamic system. Now, why is that? Um, if you look at work that people like um, Adam Savory have done in Zimbabwe, um, um, you notice the vast plains of Africa. Um, we've got the grasses growing, the wildebeest are going across. It's only until man gets involved, but we're getting regeneration of the soil there because as the grass is being eaten, the wildebeest and all the animals are pooing and we're getting a cycle structure. It's almost as if the grass is growing so it can be fertilized to produce new grass. And so the cow plays an integral part within a biodynamic system. So ideally, um, you need to grow farm animals to get better composting to improve the fertility of the soil. So biodynamic farming is in America, in Germany, oh God, not in America, in Germany has now overtaken um, organic um, growing. And certainly in Walida, we saw the introduction of animals, etc., and things like that. They come in, we've got an adder colonies. So, uh, moved into the area because of the correct nat natural environment that there was available. So working with nature, grow the plants like we grow deadly nightshade, for instance, in a woodland area, because that's how it normally appears in nature. So think about how a plant appears in nature. 
and using the system, we're maintaining the fertility within the system and we're restoring the structure of the soil. And we can do that. We can actually repair the soil. Um, but I think that needs to be the first thing we do. For every 10 units of energy we put into a conventional farm, we get one unit out of food in energy. That's unsustainable. With a biodynamic system, we're maintaining the energy within the system. That's what we're trying to do. Now, some of these ideas were off the wall. You know, we have seed charts where you set according to star calendars and things like that. You know, that's some of the woo. But the basic principles of biodynamics are something that I think that we need to be adopted. I'm also keen on the permaculture, which is a similar system, and no dig. Um, a lot of the CO2 in that upper atmosphere comes from agriculture, and that is due to ploughing. What we certainly need to do is stop ploughing, and certainly things like no dig, that people like Charles Dowding, if you look on YouTube, uses no dig, and that's what I try and use in, when I'm growing my food, for instance, um, try and avoid digging the soil because you're releasing CO2 and you're destroying the soil structure, allowing rain and, and everything like that to get into the soil. So I try and cover the ground, ideally with compost. That's what Charles does, a you know, nice thick layer of compost, and that stops the weeds from coming up. But you're no, not improving the biome within the soil. I talked about in the human gut, we need to improve the biome within soil, within our, um, in our um, agricultural systems. And this is um, something that, um, Steiner developed. Um, he was uh, obviously a follower of Johannes van Goethe, who is probably Germany's most famous German. And um, one thing he thought about was actually looking at the structure of plants. This is what Goethe proposed. By looking, getting to know plants, their form and structure, we can have an indication of how they're going to act in terms of um, the clinical properties. Now, you may think, well, that sounds a bit strange. Well, I'll explain there is science behind that. Um, so understanding a plant, we do a Gertian observation. Uh, it's only a few times in my life. Um, when Prince Charles talks to his plants, he's um, uh, probably doing a Gertian observation. Um, and interesting that Prince Charles at uh, Highgrove um, does have um, a biodynamics in operation there. Um, you can see some of his ideas. You can see where they, they originally come from. Um, a little bit of Steiner in there as well. I would phone him up and ask him, but he never returns my calls. Um, um, but uh, but what's your this seems complete? This is woo, you may think. What's your looking at a plant? Can that give us an indication of its medicinal properties? Well, let's take a look at plants. They belong to families, so we've got 620 families. Um, let's take one particular family, the rose family or rosaceae. Um, let's take some examples of that. Um, let's pick, take uh, hawthorn, for instance. Yeah, we just talked about that. Um, let's have a look at meadow sweets, apples, cherries, peaches, roses, of course, the, the damask rose, which is the one we use in medicine. We don't use the hybrids or anything like that. We have to use the, the damask rose, almonds, strawberries. Now, if you take a look at a strawberry flower and you compare that to an hawthorn flower, you will find that they have exactly the same symmetrical structure. The separation of the, the sepals and everything is the same. Same is true with apples, cherries, peaches. It's exactly the same. The leaf structure, the mathematical structure um, of how the leaves are arranged is the same across the family. If we look at another family, the potato family, the Solanaceae, like, for instance, the deadly nightshade, for instance, look at its flowers. They look exactly the same as the flowers on a pepper, on a potato, on a tomato, on a tobacco. What is interesting with the um, potato family is, let's say if we take belladonna, deadly nightshade, it contains, it looks exactly the same as a tomato. Yeah, in, in terms of its leaves and its flower structures, it contains a substance called atropine, which is an alkaloid. Peppers contain capsaicin, which is an alkaloid. Tomatoes contain alkaloids. Tobacco contains nicotine, which is an alkaloid. Interesting that um, atropine, which is in deadly nightshade, and nicotine work on the same receptors within the human body. That's a bit spooky, isn't it? So you can see where the Gertin observation ideas come in with the science. So looking at the woo, we can then see, and this idea, this concept of patterns in nature, this isn't woo. This was put forward by a guy called Murray Gell-Mann. Um, who in 1969 won the Nobel Prize for Physics. Um, he was a guy who discovered quarks. Um, 
the, the fundamental particles of, of all nature. Um, but he talks about complex patterns in nature, this complexity theory. And this applies very much in towards the botanical world as well. So looking at understanding the complexity theory. So a few final slides. I'm um, sorry I've been taking your evening. I hope you find it moderately interesting. I want to talk about a plant um, I spend a lot of time with because um, um, one of my roles at Walida when I was working with them was to um, try and um, deal with one of their main products, um, uh, which is mistletoe. Now, this was proposed by uh, Rudolf Steiner in the 1920s um, using the Goethean principles um, to potentially have a role in cancer therapy, for instance. That's um, how it was postulated by Steiner. Um, now, his idea was, by looking at the Goethean principles, was it's a ball-like structure, it's semi-parasitic, it's growing on a host, um, it bears no relationship in structure to the host, um, doing some harm potentially to the host, it does have green leaves, so it's a photosynthesis as well. So his hypothesis was um, to try and potentially use this as a treatment. Now, that sounds completely woo and off the wall, but he developed uh, mistletoe injections um, with um, a pharmacist called Ita Wegman, and obviously this became part of anthroposophical medicine in terms of, um, of therapies. And there's an example of some of the ladies in Switzerland um, uh, where mistletoe therapy is, is used. Um, they actually have clinics there where people get conventional medicine and may get mistletoe given alongside that. Um, um, now, the big problem I've always had with, with mistletoe is um, obviously there's the issue in terms of studies and certainly as a company, we, we really struggled because, um, you know, we sell the ampules in Germany for one euro or whatever. Um, there's no money there for us to fund the randomized placebo controlled double blind studies. And yes, there's plenty of cohort studies. Um, I've just given you my opinions on those. And there's a RCT um, looked at quality of life, for instance, which shows some benefits. And that was done in Russia. Yeah, we're not going to get these done in Britain. Um, certainly not. Um, but one thing we have got going, one thing that is happening at the moment is a double blind randomized placebo controlled study um, looking at mistletoe and pancreatic cancer. Now, one thing about studies is what we try and do is we power the study. What do we mean by that? With the COVID studies, for instance, what they've done is made sure they've done the studies in areas where there's a high level of COVID infections. And the reasons for doing that is because if you did it in areas where there's no infection, you wouldn't see any difference between the control and the, and the active arms of the study. So what they've done here is gone for a high powered area such as pancreatic cancer, and the outcomes are, are very, very poor, as Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computer, they couldn't do anything for him. Um, so this is a study um, which is a double-blind randomized study. Um, hopefully it's coming out in the next year or so. And this is, shows you the difference in thinking. Um, obviously Sweden have been in the news obviously over the past year, but this has been supported by Swedish organizations, the Karolinska Institute, and also Swedish charities, et cetera, who are funding these very expensive studies. And unfortunately, this kind of thing is never gonna happen in Britain, which is an absolute tragedy. But you can see this is, uh, obviously I'm conscious of what I say, because obviously this is an area that's uh, 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 people, um, uh, um, anyway, so we look at herbal concepts. So in Tibetan medicine, um, they would use Chinese caterpillar fungus um, for these kind of oncological therapies. In China, they use astragalus, which is vetch. And uh, the astragalus in China is increasingly being given by injection, by sterile production, using some of the techniques which we've just shown. What is interesting, when you look at the biochemical systems of how they work on the human body, I'm not going to go into the biochemistry. <laughs> it's a long topic, that is. Um, but the um, proteins that are induced by um, these drugs, because they stimulate the, by these plants, because they stimulate the immune system, in mistletoe, cordyceps and astragalus are exactly the same pathways. Isn't that spooky that something from Western medicine from the 1920s follows the same pathways as something from Tibetan and also from Chinese medicine? Um, that's another thing that makes me think um, 
you know, um, this perennial philosophy. Um, and I'm going to leave you a quote with all this um, because we are now living, in my opinion, in a brave new world. Um, and um, medical science is making such remarkable progress that soon none of us will be well. Um, the big problem is, as we get more scientific, scientific servitude he talks about, and as we get more advanced in our science, um, the big studies can only be done by big corp organizations, big governments, et cetera, and because they have the infrastructure to do that. And they also have a bureaucracy that goes with that. And the more complex the science, the more removed it's going to get from some of the areas that I've been talking about tonight. And this is the danger of scientific servitude. We need to go back to where we started and know it for the very first time, which links in nicely with the original uh, mantra from the start of the talk. Okay, I hope you found that uh, interesting. And uh, I'll go and have a swing of Guinness. <laughs>